brothers and sisters at the Ark and the Dove, I want to start in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Spirit. Come, Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. You probably know that I was planning on being right there with you at the Ark and the Dove for these days of prayer and celebration. And I'm really disappointed not to be able to do that. I'm not in any kind of serious difficulty, but I've had some health issues that have just dragged me down in recent weeks. And it just seemed wiser to come to you this way rather than getting on a plane and, and uh, taking on the rig rigors of travel. But I want you to know the anniversary of the outpouring of the spirit at the Duquesne weekend has really marked my entire life. As a little uh, 20 year old girl, never having made a retreat in my life, when I got into that foyer at the Ark and the Dove, I felt very insecure. And it could be that some of you listening to this or who will hear it in the future might feel I felt like everybody else had was so far ahead of me, knew God so much better, knew the, the Bible so much better, were much more prayerful. And I was really a newcomer to the Key Rose Scripture Study Group. I didn't have longstanding friendship and friendships and relationships there. So that added to my insecurity. The other thing that made me very insecure is that I was probably the only public school girl there. My parents were uh, immigrants, did not have, uh, children of immigrants, did not have money to send us to Catholic school. So I went all the way through 12 years of public school at Florence Avenue grade school and Irvington High School in Irvington, New Jersey. In fact, I only had a few, two, three friends who were even Christian. Most of my close friends were Jews. And so when I got there to the Ark and the Dove on February 17th, 1967, as Patty Gallagher, I felt like I should just keep my mouth shut, <laughs> listen, take in, hope I didn't, because of just ignorance and, and lack of background uh, in the Catholic faith. But that event not only changed my life dramatically, but as you know, it changed the face of the church. And without overstating it, in some ways, it changed the face of the world. I uh, took out a copy of this book, As by a New Pentecost. And uh, I believe it's for sale right there at the Ark and the Dove. It's in many different translations now. In fact, I'm very thrilled that it is um, being translated, being uh, published this coming year in Mexico. And I've dedicated that particular uh, edition to Our Lady of Guadalupe. So the story has been told around the world. And the story is told not just in books like this, in paper and pen, but it's been, it's been told in the lives of millions upon millions of men, women, and children. And I took out my copy of As By A New Pentecost in English, and I reviewed it. You would say, well, if you lift it, what did, why did you need to review it? Because it's such a multifaceted story. And even though I not only have lived it, but have really devoted my whole adult life to telling the story verbally, traveling to conferences and events all over the world, online, in writing, even though I've devoted my whole adult life to telling this story, I have to tell you, I am still in utter amazement and wonderment when I touch this event. My husband tells me, and he has heard my testimony more than any other living <laughs> human being, he tells me that the telling of the story of the Duquesne weekend always moves him on a very deep level. And I have to tell you, brothers and sisters, that very often reading the testimonies, and not just my testimony in this book, but the testimonies of other eyewitnesses and people who 
whom God used leading up to that um, mid-February 1967, reading those testimonies often over these 55 years has moved me to tears. Why should that be? Well, because it's more than a story. It's a manifestation of the love of God. It's a manifestation of the power of God. It's a manifestation of the uh, simplicity of God. Why do I say that? Because we were not a group of theologians who were gathered at the Ark and the Dove. We were not even that, not even a, a group of really holy young people. I, I remember, um, and this is in my book, some fellow who just showed up on, I, I don't know if it was Friday night, must have been Friday night. He was reeking of men's cologne. And I remember it was English leather. Johnny, I don't know if you remember English leather, but it's a very strong, strong smelling cologne. He was obviously coming there to a co-ed retreat to attract girls, not necessarily to seek a life-changing experience with the Holy Spirit. So uh, to touch this event again, to speak about this event, to know that you are there gathered to celebrate this event moves me very deeply. Uh, I believe it was, in fact, I'm wearing something very similar to what I wore on the Duquesne weekend. I, I had a shirt on that was like a blue flower. I, I don't still have the shirt, but um, as I was deciding what to wear for this little recording, I thought, well, let me get back in touch with what I put on. You know, this will interest maybe some of the girls. I know we have uh, young people from the Duquesne prayer group who are going to be gathered and other young people who gather at the, at the Ark and the Dove. You know, a big deal for me was when I got to the Ark and the Dove, I realized I had forgotten all my makeup at home. And it was a co-ed retreat. And one of the one of the leaders of Key Row was somebody who interested me very much romantically. And so to not to have any anything to put on my face to sort of cover up blemishes and so on was a big deal. But in a way, it was uh, very um, symbolic of what the Lord was asking. I think it was on the Duquesne weekend that I first heard the reality of um, the Veni Creator Spiritus. I'm not positive. I know that melody was in our books, Morning Praise and Even Song, which we used at the Key Row meetings every week. So maybe I was already familiar with singing it in that melody. But the fact that there in the upper room chapel, which you will have a chance to pray in during these days, in the upper room chapel, we intoned the Gregorian chant melody, Come, O Creator, o Spirit blessed, and in our hearts take up thy rest. Come with thy grace and heavenly aid to fill the hearts which thou hast made. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, I can't hear that simple, basic Gregorian chant melody without being filled with kind of a sense of awe and wonder. And the professor who introduced us to it on that retreat uh, was a, a professor of um, church history. And so he knew very well the history of that hymn, how it had been written in the ninth century by a Benedictine monk, monk and it, was, it has been sung in our church at all important functions at synods and ordinations. And, and he said to us, every time we're in this chapel, we're going to invoke the Holy Spirit with these words and with this melody. And it was as if he were saying, we're until we know that the Holy Spirit has come. And indeed, that's what happened because it wasn't just a song. And Father Kent Lamesa uh, describes this so beautifully in his book, Come Creator Spirit. He says it's from the ninth century on, every time God hears this hymn, Veni Creator Spiritus, these words, 
this invocation, he doesn't just hear the voices of those who are singing it, not the 20, 25 students and professors from Duquesne University who were gathered February 17th through uh, 19th, 1967. But Father Ke Cardinal Cantalamesa says, God hears our voices joined with the voices of all the saints who have, who have invoked him with these words since the ninth century on, which is a beautiful thought. And have that in mind as you sing. I hope you're going to sing it uh, in the Gregorian chant melody at least once during your, your time of celebration. I think that as I reflect on uh, what one of the many, many, many things that God has given to the universal church through the charismatic renewal, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the Duquesne weekend, and the, the uh, spread of this grace of baptism of the Spirit all over the world, is this message. Don't forget the Holy Spirit. And I feel that is something I need to say to you 55 years after the Duquesne Week and you who are attending this event. I know it's a small gathering, but you who are going to be attending it um, virtually and who will be seeing it in the, in the years and, and, and uh, decades to come. Don't forget the Holy Spirit, because brothers and sisters, it's so easy to forget him to just pay him lip service and not to bow before his sovereign majesty. And I hope that in that upper room chapel, there's going to be a lot of bowing that takes place during these days, a lot of kneeling in reverence. Sometimes I feel like I want to go through the world saying this to people, the Holy Spirit is God sovereign God. He's not a thing. He's not like an embarrassing relative who shows up and you wish you weren't there. No, the Holy Spirit is equal to the Father and the Son. And we should not only invite him, invoke him, but we should be yearning for him. I just wrote this in my journal in the last few days. I am longing for a move of God, I'm, I'm longing for what is, quote, of God, because so much that we deal with is really of our own thoughts or of human origin. And one of the things that the, that the Duquesne Weekend witnesses to is a sovereign intervention of the sovereign God, who is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God. That's why I say, gather in that chapel, and I, how I wish I could be right there with you, but I'll be united with you during these coming days. How I wish I could bow once more in the presence of that, that tabernacle, which is the original tabernacle. And I know Johnny and the rest of the people who were involved in obtaining uh, the, the Ark and the Dove had to work hard to keep hold of that original tabernacle to bow again before the presence of the living God in that upper room chapel, in that tabernacle. Don't forget the Holy Spirit is God. He is to be adored and reverenced and loved and worshiped and invited and invoked. You know, Elena Guerra, whom I did not know at the time of the Duquesne weekend, I only met her later, actually, um, when I wrote about her in this book, it's really thanks to my husband, Al Mansfield, who is uh, a student of history. And he's the one that told me about Blessed Elena Guerra. In fact, I have my relic right here, first class relic of Blessed Elena. And I know right at the Ark and the Dove, if you don't know where it is, ask Johnny and he's going to show you where this first class relic, one of these first class relics of Elena Guerra is. I didn't know about Elena at the time you know, a little Italian nun from Lucca, Italy, who founded the Oblates of the Holy Spirit. But she was passionately in love with the third person of the Blessed Trinity. And she was a great uh, ecumenist. She had a deep, deep desire for ecumenical unity. And that was one of the reasons 
why she was um, calling people to pray, to continue pray, prayer to the Holy Spirit was to, to mend, to heal the divisions in Christianity. When Lena Guerra said, um, the whole, we don't have to be jealous of the first, the, the first believers, of those who were present at Pentecost, because the Pentecost continues. Pentecost is always going on, and the Holy Spirit will always to invoke him. But, she said, who really wants him? Who really desires him? Who really longs for him? And so that's a challenge to you and to me, brothers and sisters. You know, I've been baptized in the Spirit now 55 years as of this, this coming uh, weekend. You know, do I desire, I have to ask myself as an examination of conscience, do I really desire the Holy Spirit with all my heart and soul? Do I still pray to him with the kind of longing, with the kind of... Um, expectation do i still expect the holy spirit to work his signs and wonders as by a new pentecost i'm going to challenge you brothers and sisters al and i pray the veni creator spiritus every single day and we've taught it to our children during the the time preparing for pentecost but i have to tell you sometimes like with all prayers that we memorize I can just rattle off the Veni Creator Spiritus without engaging my heart, without engaging my spirit, without stirring up that expectation. This Holy Spirit can change me, can purify me, can make me a saint, which is what we should all be wanting, can use me whether I'm traveling around the world on a plane and speaking at big conferences or just here in my own home, this Holy Spirit can use me to change the lives of people, people who are still with us here on this, on, on this side of heaven, but people who have already gone beyond. What do I mean? I've experienced something in this last year. Al and I retired uh, formally a year ago, although we're still very much, he's writing a weekly commentary on the, the weekly scriptures, and I'm, I'm going to Brazil twice a week by uh, Zoom, by uh, um, various means, and I've gone to other countries as well, to their conferences. But I've experienced something this last year, and I want to tell you about it in case it starts happening to you. The Lord is, the Holy Spirit is bringing back to my mind and heart people that I haven't had contact with for decades, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, have already died and are already, you know, already gone from this earth. And I've been reflecting on that. Lord, why are you bringing back these people to my mind who I no longer have contact with? And I believe, brothers and sisters, it's the Holy Spirit. I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to stir up in us who are baptized in the Spirit, prayer, intercession. I don't know what's happening in their lives. Maybe they're at a moment of crisis. Maybe they've, they've left the, the faith. And, you know, picking up this book again, brothers and sisters, and this should be a real prayer of ours while we're together during these days. I, I, I'm in, in touch with the fact that some of the people who were with us on the Duquesne weekend no longer seem to be in the church, no longer seem to be believers. And we don't know, we don't ju judge why they may have, you know, wandered away. But we have power in our prayer to intercede for them, to open themselves up once again, to the Holy Spirit, to the grace of God. Just yesterday, Al and I got a Christmas uh, Christmas letter uh, by, by uh, email from um, some folks that we knew way, way back in the 60s who were very instrumental in bringing the grace of baptism, the Spirit, to many young people. 
My husband was one of them at the time. And um, said, and I felt the same way, as we read their Christmas letter, it left us with a certain sadness. Why? The name of Jesus was not mentioned one time that I remember. These are good people, very good people. I don't, I don't judge them. But not everyone who began with us back in 1967 is still making the same journey. And so we who are making the journey have a great responsibility as intercessors. And through our prayer of intercession, as the Holy Spirit brings folks to our minds, and I don't know if this is maybe happening to some of you who are listening, but I think perhaps uh, during the pandemic, as we have had less physical interaction and been able to go and do less, that maybe it's possible that our spirits are becoming more open and that... Um, you know, one of the greatest joys of my life was to, quote, win back, win back someone who was so instrumental in my baptism in the spirit, win back. How do I mean win back? Just through prayer of intercession, through, through reaching out with, um, with love, with kindness, with a word of testimony. And so brothers and sisters, 55 years, that's a long time. And you have had many people that have passed through your lives in the years that you have been baptized in the Spirit. And those of you who are young, you know, hold on to these friends that you have and, and keep them encouraged to cling to the Lord, to cling to the Holy Spirit, to cling to the will of the Father. Um, Johnny, uh, I, I've told you I had some things I wanted to share, and I still have more if it's okay with you. Um, one of the Psalms that has come very strongly to my mind uh, preparing, because until, until two days ago, I thought I'd be getting on a plane and, and, and seeing you in person, those of you who are there at the Oregon Ark in the Tub. And one of the Psalms that has been on my mind to share at the Ark in the Tub, so now I'm sharing it with everybody, is Psalm 115, and it is a, uh, a beautiful psalm that expresses the humility that we should have in our hearts as we celebrate this anniversary. You know, I think uh, one of my dear friends who was with me at the Ark and the Dove, who was a member of Key Row many, many, many uh, months and years longer than I was, was really holy. Is already gone to the Lord's many years. She died uh, about eight years ago. Karen Sefsik Treber, you can read her testimony in, in my book, As by a New Pentecost. Um, anytime we have the privilege to celebrate a birthday, an anniversary, and for us in the in charismatic renewal, this anniversary of the Duquesne weekend. This is the sentiment that should fill our hearts and be expressed through our lips. 115. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your mercy and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not feel. Feet, but they do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them are like them, and so are all who trust in them. And then the psalmist uh, begins to call people to trust in the Lord with him. Oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Oh, house of Aaron, put your trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. All you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. And I feel like saying today, um, 
Andreas and Katia representing all of the Hispanic renewal. Put your trust in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Sergio and, and Katia from Brazil, all the Portuguese speaking people who will be following this anniversary. Put your trust in the Lord. He is your help and your shield. All you English speaking people from around the world here in Australia and um, <laughs> everywhere the English, yeah, the English language is spoken. Put your trust in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. All you Italians. I know I've been sending the information out to my friends in Rome. Um, put your trust in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. The Lord has been mindful of us and he will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He'll bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. Here is for the future, brothers and sisters. May the Lord give you increase. May the Lord give you increase. If, you know, sometimes uh, we see the number 120 million. I think something I read just in the last few days, maybe the Karis uh, event that's going to be held in, uh, in Rhode Island. I think the, the, the number they were giving was 150 million. Anyway, who can count the millions? May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. That's us. He's entrusted this earth and this grace of baptism, the spirit to such as us. <laughs> the dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any that go down into silence. But we, we will bless the Lord. From this time forth and forevermore, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So what should fill our hearts? Great humility. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us. When I think of who I am and what I was when I was walking into that retreat house without a whole lot of knowledge of, of the the faith without a whole lot of knowledge of the Holy Spirit, of the scripture. One of the reasons why I joined that scripture study group was to try to learn a little bit about the Bible, about the Bible. And some of you have heard me say this. The assignment that we're, we were given was to read the first four chapters of the Acts of the Apostles. I didn't read that one time. I read it over and over and over again. Why? Because I was sure that all those other Catholic kids were going to get more out of those four chapters than I would. And I was deathly afraid that someone on that retreat would ask me what I thought about the Acts of the Apostles. And I just didn't want to show everyone how ignorant I was. So, brothers and sisters, it's been entrusted to us, this grace, the baptism of the Spirit. The other psalm that I want to share with you and invite you to reflect on yourselves when you're in that upper room chapel or back in prayer back home is 127. And for the, the Brazilians, it's going to be one. Um, uh, I'm sorry, 126. And for the Brazilians, it's going to be 125. And you know, I began using this psalm to give my testimony way, way back, maybe in, in 1968. And I, I didn't know the, the scripture that well, but I must have come across it. And it seemed like a wonderful description of the Duquesne weekend. It says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those in a dream. <laughs> Our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are glad indeed. Why do I say that? Because there was a dreamlike quality to life after the Duquesne weekend. When I got back onto campus, I did feel like I was, I was like a person in a dream. You know, the reality that we had just experienced with the outpouring of the Spirit was so overwhelming 
that I couldn't discipline my mind to think about anything else. I couldn't bring my mind to my studies. And I was a French major at the time. So on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, all I had was French classes. And my French teacher said in French about me, I imagine to humiliate me, we're waiting the awakening of Mademoiselle Gallagher. Because I guess I must have been looking out the window sort of in a daze, waiting the awakening of Mademoiselle Gallagher. And I felt like saying, oh, professor, <laughs> I've awakened, but I've been awakened to God. I've been awakened to the Lord, to the Holy Spirit, to the spiritual life. And in comparison to that, this seems like a dream. Our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue with shouts of joy. One of my friends in the, those days following the Duquesne weekend walked me home. He was a wonderful guy, his name David, not David Mangan, another David. He walked me home and he said to me, Patty, if I didn't know you better, I'd say you were drunk. I must have had a drunk look about me. And I, I began to laugh and I picked up my, my little, little bitty uh, New Testament and I opened it up to, to uh, the Acts of the Apostles. And I read him those words in the early chapters of the Acts where they said, you know, these men are drunk. I said, well, David, that's the very thing that they said after Pentecost. We were like men in a dream. But Johnny, um, when I reread this um, psalm, the very next verses say this. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. He that goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, will come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Streams in the desert. I believe that's your theme, is it not? Streams in the desert. I didn't even know. I didn't even know it was right here in this uh, psalm. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Brothers and sisters, there's been a lot of weeping in recent times. We worldwide have been through a lot of suffering. And you may have friends like the ones that I was talking about who were very close, who, who came to prayer meetings, who work with you on committees, who, who taught baptism in the, the Life and the Spirit seminar who have now wandered into other paths. And this is a cause of grief. And we can win them back through our prayer and our sacrifice. But those who sow in tears, this Psalm promises, will reap with shouts of joy. And brothers and sisters, we have to believe that that is the truth. This brings me to the other passage, the other part of the, of the scripture that I want to give to you as an anniversary gift. It's 1 Corinthians 3, um, starting uh, with verse, verses 1 through 8. And um, I want to read it to you because, you know, there are some of you who are new to baptism, the spirit, new to charismatic, and maybe new to leadership. But there are many who have been around for a long time, like me and like David Mangan, uh, you know, 55 years. I was 20 at the time, so now you know I'm 75. And David is a few years older. And uh, for those of us who have been around for a while, sometimes there is the temptation to try to own the grace to try to own it as if it belonged to us. And David and I, from the very start, have said, we're not founders. This wasn't our idea. Actually, renewing baptism, uh, renewing confirmation, now there was David's idea. It was a brilliant idea. And we have David Mangan to thank for bringing that idea to the group at the Ark and the Dove. I, I think I was one of the only people who really thought it was brilliant. And David and I agreed that even if no one else wanted to renew their confirmation, we did. And we and the Lord heard us, even though we didn't do it formally. 
the way we thought we might. But you know, there is a temptation. If you are the uh, leader of a prayer group, if you are the founder of a community or the leader of a covenant community or a ministry, um, a ministry somewhere in the world, and you've exercised a leadership position, if you have written books, there's always a temptation for that book to stick to your hand as if you own it. But, you know, um, that's a real temptation that we have to resist. Listen to these words from 1 Corinthians 3. St. Paul is speaking to the Corinthians, and you know they were rather contentious and very, um, very much into rivalry and pride. St. Paul says, I could not address you as spiritual men, but as men of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even yet you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh behaving like ordinary men? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely men? What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. <laughs> so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are equal and each shall receive his wages according to his labor. In the, uh, I went back and looked it up because the way I remember this passage, uh, it said, neither he who plants nor he who waters counts for anything, but only God who gives the growth. And that's in the New Jerusalem um, translation. And he goes on, he says, I laid a foundation, another man is building on it. Let each man take care how he builds upon it. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, for it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters. That kind of makes me tremble. In other words, we are nothing. We are nothing, no matter what position we may hold, no matter what title we may have, no matter how many people have come to the Lord through us, neither he who plants nor he who waters counts for anything. Only God who gives the growth. And sometimes we need an attitude adjustment. We need to detach. We need to let go. We need to relinquish. And Father Cantalonese loved this. I think it's Psalm 68. I could be wrong on that. I'm going to ask my husband, honey, check me out on give the, give the power back to God. Father Cantalonese likes to quote this psalm as an expression of the baptism in the spirit. Give the power back to God. Give the glory to God. But give the power back to God. We, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll find the reference where I believe it's 68. Give the power back to God. Let's not fool ourselves into thinking that it's our power, that we can accomplish anything without sovereign God, without the sovereign and all-powerful Holy Spirit. Another phrase that I learned from Father Raniero some years ago was, do you remember, uh, was when John Paul II was still alive, and he said we should be rekindling Eucharistic amazement, amazement at the gift of the Eucharist. Well, Cantula Mesa said in one of the things I read, maybe it was in, um, maybe it was in something he wrote uh, for uh, Good News out of England, and Michelle is here. They, Michelle, you all did such a beautiful job on that publication. I used to love, love getting it and reading it. I believe it was there that Cantela Mesa wrote, we who are baptized in the spirit, involved in the charismatic renewal, 
we need to rekindle a charismatic amazement. We need to go back and be amazed all over again at the what our Protestant brothers and sisters often call the mighty baptism in the Holy Spirit. And it is mighty. It is mighty. Last thing I'm going to say in this uh, exhortation is, when I was in that upper room chapel, I knew Our Lady. I knew she was the mother of Jesus. And uh, I wore a tiny miraculous medal around my neck, which my parents had given me. I still have that same one on. I got it when I was about 15. Um, but did I have a deep devotion to Our Lady? I couldn't say that I, it's not like I prayed the rosary all the time. Uh, I, I can't say that I was known for my Marian devotion. But what happened to me in that upper room chapel when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit was a deep identification with Our Lady, with Mary. I felt like from that moment on, her Magnificat became my Magnificat. In fact, when I got back to my bedroom in the, the little uh, dove, which is where I was sleeping at the time, and I opened at random our book, Morning Praise Evensong, which had the office in it, my, I, my eyes fell immediately on these words from Luke 1. Then Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for God, for God who is mighty has done marvels for me and holy is his name. He's looked on his servant in her nothingness. Henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. And in that book, my morning praise Eden song, as I read the words of the Magnificat that night, the night I was baptized in the spirit, I underlined these words. And his mercy is from age to age on those who fear him. His mercy, his mercy. And you could say this whole outpouring of the spirit for the last 55 years has been an expression of his mercy. His mercy, God wants to show mercy to his people. And he's not finished yet. If we're 150, 170 million Catholics all over the world, he's not finished yet. He wants to show his mercy. And Our Lady, who she is in her person, but her example, her teaching is key to our fulfilling what God intends in this grace of baptism in the spirit. Because she, uh, she um, personifies purity. She per personifies humility. She personifies docility, obedience, um, uh, the Lord used me back on June 3rd of 2017 in Olympic in Circus Maximus when the renewal was celebrating its uh, golden jubilee in the, in the presence of the Holy Father. And I didn't know I would be, I knew I would be at the celebration, but actually I was sick that day and I didn't feel like I had the strength to, to get out of bed and get over to Circus Maximus. So I lay down for a little while and then I revived. I didn't have any word in my mind. I, I didn't have, I didn't have it in mind that I was going to give a prophetic word. But during the singing in tongues, one phrase from the gospel kept coming to my mind. And it was this, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. And I remember thinking, what am I supposed to do with this? The Pope is here. You know, the, the stage was actually filled not with Catholic charismatic leaders. It was filled with leaders from other denominations the Holy Father had invited. There were a few cardinals there. Michelle was there. Um, the Gilberto, who headed the, the Catholic fraternity at the time. But I, I wasn't in familiar, a familiar setting with people that I knew well. But this, the word was there. I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the, the fields are white for harvest. So I, I, I had been kneeling. I stood and um, I, I walked up to the microphone, not knowing what other words were going to be there, not knowing who, whose permission I should seek as I 
walked by the Pope. I think I, I nodded to him. Pentelinus was there. I nodded to him. But I opened my eyes and my mouth, and these are the words that came out. Brothers and sisters, as we were praying in the Spirit, the Lord gave me a word, and it was this. Lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. And if you would obey me, and if you would obey the prompting of my spirit, you will yet see infinitely more than you can ask or imagine. You will yet see the power of my spirit descend upon the human race. I tell you, the fields are white for harvest. But I need, now here are the Marian words, listen for them. But I need your obedience. I need your docility. I need your faith. And you will yet see marvels that will astound you infinitely more than you can ask or imagine for the glory of my name. Now, those are Marian words, faith, obedience, docility, um, infinitely more than you can ask or imagine. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that Our Lady has a big, big role to play in what's yet coming. Even ecumenical unity, Mary has a big role to play in that. I can start telling you stories now, but I don't have time, of people who have been drawn to Our Lady from other denominations have come into a, an experience of the Holy Spirit in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and Our Lady has played a great big part. So let's not be afraid to speak of, of Our Lady to uh, honor Our Lady, to uh, pray pray to Our Lady for this new Pentecost. She's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. She knows him better than anyone else. One more prophetic word I want to mention to you, and this, this came to me um, at one of our own conferences here in New Orleans in uh, March, I believe it was, of 20, um, uh, Al, was it 2019? 19, 19. Um, Again, I didn't go with a prophetic word in mind, but um, we were singing this marvelous song. Google it. Overshadow me by Sean Tobin, Dr. Sean Tobin. Overshadow me, O Lord. Oh, it's a Marian. It's a Marian cry. Overshadow me, O Lord. Let my life proclaim your, your praise, your, your word. Come, come like fire from on high and rest on me. Anyway, we were singing that. And a word actually doubled me over. And that doesn't happen very often. I just felt doubled over by the power of this word. And the word was this. And I stood up and I proclaimed it. And it's this. The Lord said, I am releasing upon you a torrent of grace. I'm releasing upon you a torrent of grace, not just a current of grace, but a torrent of grace. This day will mark the release of a torrent of my grace, pouring out not only upon you, but upon the whole world. Enter under this torrent of grace. Receive this torrent of grace and receive it now. The spirit and the bride say, come. Now, I was proclaiming, and I told you it doubled me over. I was, I was shaking under the power of that word. But I really didn't know what it was. It's not like I, I, I expected it. It's not like I made it up. I didn't make it up. I, I didn't make it up any more than I made up. <laughs> Lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. But I've reflected on it since then. And I shared this the last time I was at the Ark and the Dove. I've been reflecting on what's the difference between a current of grace, which is a phrase that Cardinal Sunins coined way back. I read it in his little book, Spiritual Journeys. And I quoted it in As by a New Pentecost, the version that was published in 2017. Um, you are a current of grace, Cardinal Sunin said, and our present Holy Father has taken that up and has told us that's our identity. So I was reflecting, well, what's the difference between a current of grace 
and a torrent of grace. I don't know. But what's come to me is this. A current is in the water. It moves in the water. It, 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 uh, it, it, it can move us as we're in the water. But a torrent comes directly from heaven. And brothers and sisters, I believe, I feel like what we need now in the world, what we need in the charismatic renewal, what we need uh, in the church is another sovereign, direct intervention of God, of the Holy There's so much that's human that's being put forth as being spiritual, so much. In fact, I wrote this in my journal the other day. I want what is of God. I want what is pure, what is of God. What isn't dirtied up by our fingers, our fingerprints are of God. Now that might seem, you know, very lofty and it is lofty, but that's exactly what happened February 17th, 18th and 19th of 1967 in that upper room chapel at the Ark and the Dove. It wasn't our idea. It wasn't our doing. It wasn't, it wasn't our words. It wasn't our, it wasn't our holiness. It was God having mercy, the mighty one, God who is mighty, having mercy on us and holy is his name. And that's what I'm praying for right now, brothers and sisters. If there's anything to this torrent of grace prophecy that we should be praying, we should be interceding, we should be begging God for water to come in abundance directly from heaven for a breakthrough of so much grace, so much power, so much anointing, so much love, so much purity, so much, so much uh, zeal, 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 that the face of the earth will be changed. And, you know, this torrent of grace prophetic word came just before the pandemic. And I have thought, you know, uh, I mean, a short time before the pandemic, how, how is this a torrent of grace? How is this good? Well, we recognize our need, our, our, our weakness, our sinfulness, our need more than ever. We have been reduced to uh, using other means, other platforms in the fields. And we had Father... Um, Mark Goring giving us a, a, a prophecy that doubled him over, saying, um, the Lord saying, you know, that he was uh, causing a drought to come, a drought, a drought of praise, and that we would long for times of praise, we would long for times of, of worship, and that there would be platforms built in the fields. And at the time, I was thinking, you know, uh, nails and, and, uh, and would, but in fact, I think what we've seen over this time is virtual platforms that have enabled us to preach the gospel, to reach one another in, you know, out there, the fields are white for harvest. Brothers and sisters, I wish I had something more, um, more uh, clear to say to you, but I think what uh, the Lord has entrusted to me, I have said, He's looking for humility, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. Unless the Lord build a house, they labor in vain, 125. Unless the Lord guard the city in vain, the guards keep watch in vain. You rise early and you go to, go to sleep late, for he gives to his beloved in sleep. Torrents, torrents of grace, torrents of grace to aid the current of grace to accomplish what it needs to accomplish. And um, I want to close with uh, the blessing. If you haven't heard the blessing as, as it has been sung all over the world, you know, I listened to it from Ireland, from I just listened to the, I think probably the, the originators of the song sing it yesterday. And it's the prayer of uh, Aaron's blessing used by St. Francis of Assisi who brought, who brought a renewal to the church. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you and um, 
and may the Lord uncover his face to you and give you peace. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you and your children and your children's children. I pray that what we have tasted these first 55 years is really just the beginning. God has something so big, so big, the restoration of the church, the restoration of the world. And Mary plays a part. The baptism of the spirit is a big part of it. And, you know, um, maybe I shouldn't end with something that's so colloquial as this, but, you know, I've been thinking about many of those wonderful people who have gone before us, people like uh, Father John Randall, John Randall, Jake Randall from um, Rhode Island, who was a great, great preacher and great, great lover of the Holy Spirit, great lover of Mary. And uh, he preached a homily at one of the, one of the early conferences. Uh, and the theme of it was, let's go back to making pizza pie. I don't know if any of you heard this. Johnny, does that sound familiar to you? Let's go back to making pizza pie. He talked about a pizza place in Providence, Rhode Island, that had the most fabulous pizzas. Everybody went there for pizza. And uh, they decided at a certain point that they needed to get beyond the basic pizza pie. So they started making calzones and they started making uh, Subway sandwiches. And anyway, they expanded their menu, menu and things started to decrease. And John Randall stood up and he, <laughs> with a lot of gesture, he was saying to us in the renewal, let's go back to making pizza pie. Let's go back to making pizza pie. In other words, let's not forget what got us here. The mighty baptism in the Holy Spirit, the life in the spirit seminars. Let's go back to making pizza pie. Let's not forget the Holy Spirit, who is the sovereign Lord, the, the Holy God. Let's not forget to be praying to him every day. Let's not forget to be invoking him at our meetings, teaching people about him, honoring him, loving him, kneeling before him. And so, brothers and sisters, thank you for being patient with me. Uh, you've been very patient, but then what can you do? It's a video. <laughs> so God bless you and keep you and let his face shine upon you and uncover his face to you and give you peace. Amen.